what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Let's uh, take the perspective of a user interacting with a laptop, which a lot of you are. You kind of ask the question, is my computer secure? And when you look at your computer, maybe you type in a website and it loads, and therefore you're convinced that your computer's working correctly. But it's difficult to know with certainty that you're not interacting with some spoofed or rootkitted or uh, maliciously virtualized platform that just happens to look like your intended platform. So what we'd you know, ultimately like to achieve is that we can get a concrete answer to this question, yes, my computer is doing what it's intended to be doing. So an interesting mechanism that can enable uh, these type of properties is something called dynamic root of trust. Uh, this has been mentioned a few different times this week, and I think now we're finally going to introduce it. So it's been uh, added to some hardware platforms from AMD and Intel over the last few years, and it's realized as a CPU instruction. And it validates the fact that these are complex instruction set computers. Um, but it is intended to create a secure execution environment and enable basically whatever you want, but the bootstrapping of a trustworthy execution environment. Um, a lot of the documentation will suggest that you might load a virtual machine monitor, but really it's fairly unconstrained. Um, this instruction does all these operations atomically, and this is atomically from the perspective of executing software. So when the instruction that runs after SK init or S enter uh, executes, that's in one instruction later. So we've already heard about the trusted platform module and the platform configuration registers and their ability to store measurements of software. But we've talked about these measurements as a chain, you know, a long chain beginning at some boot uh, some point in the boot process. And so what we're actually going to be able to do with dynamic root of trust is reset a select uh, subset of the platform configuration registers. Now we're going to reset these to indicate that this special event has taken place, that we've, that we've somehow changed the state of the processor in a way that tells us something about the security of the system. Um, now in order for that to be meaningful, and not to have race conditions or, or, or clever ways to be attacked, we also need to have interrupts disabled. Right? And a device could easily fire an interrupt at just the wrong moment and transfer control to a malicious interrupt handler. So part of this instruction actually disables interrupts. Um, there's also DMA-capable devices. I think they've been mentioned in a few talks before. These devices may end up having malicious firmware or being connected to another malicious device. And so we again want to take our memory region con uh, containing our security sensitive code and isolate it. So we need to protect that memory region from DMA capable devices. But other than that, it's basically the same as a measurement uh, that we've been talking about all week. So exactly what memory region is passed as the argument of this instruction will be extended into this newly reset PCR in this nice isolated environment, uh, all before the first instruction in this region is executed. So the properties that we get are these nice, strong isolation properties and kind of a break from the code that was running before we did this operation. And that enables uh, attestation to a, a more targeted um, attestation and sealing to a more targeted quantity of code, to precisely this code that comes after this instruction. Now, the point of the, the current research workshop is to discuss software-based attestation. Now, software-based attestation is an approach that is designed to achieve a dynamic root of trust without hardware support. So there's plenty of platforms out there that don't contain TPM chips, and there's plenty of other CPU architectures and embedded devices and every other kind of computing device you can think of that may not have any support built in for trustworthy computing operations. So what we're going to talk about now is how you could achieve that without the hardware support. So just some further evidence as to why we don't want to rely on hardware is that you know there may be many devices that don't have the necessary support. Some uh, chipset and platform devices are, are, have reached a level of complexity where it's sometimes difficult to, to gain assurance in their correctness. There are definitely attacks out there in the wild on some manageability interfaces. And so in a, in a particular situation, you may be stuck with hardware that has one of these vulnerabilities uh, without a resolution. So maybe you want to 
not worry about that stuff and use software-based data station instead. Um, a very interesting property, and especially in the context of this little diagram where we may want the user to learn something about the state of their computer, software-based data station doesn't require any secrets. It's based on timing and the correctness of some computations, as we'll see shortly. And so it's, it's, it's better suited for, for management by people who aren't necessarily good at, at protecting secrets. So this should be contrasted with some prior approaches. Uh, one example is, well, let's just keep our code in read-only memory, and then it's impossible to modify that code. But we've all seen, basically, that the software that humans write today has got flaws in it and vulnerabilities in it, and so it's only a matter of time until that golden image that uh, we have in this ROM chip starts to look a little tarnished. It's also difficult to get these remote properties that we'd like to achieve, uh, basically through attestation mechanisms. You just have to trust that the ROM in your system worked and that it booted up into a, a desirable configuration, and that's not necessarily uh, a, a trivial exercise. We've talked about measurements, and so you guys may have a, a pretty good idea right now of what a hashing engine might look like, but prior to the trusted computing movement as we know it today, you know, there were other proposals to do this kind of thing, and it could be difficult to guarantee that the, the thing that was doing the hashing wasn't itself malicious or compromised. There's also uh, a number of sophisticated cryptographic solutions, such as secure multi-party compu uh, computation, but in practice, the performance overhead of some of these mechanisms has, has hampered their adoption. <laughs> so, so what are some other examples of user-verifiable code execution that might be able to serve as a model for us? So the abacus, the balance, the slide rule, and even punch card mainframes are all devices that have some very tangible human feedback. When you're operating one of these devices, you can see it, you can hear it, you can feel it. You might be able to determine, you know what, that, that didn't do what I expected. And right? if you load the, right, the wrong punch cards, it's going to make a different sound when that program executes. So our environment is uh, similar to the attestation scenario we've been discussing. We've got a verification device that we just trust. Um, and we have a target device that is supposed to be running some intended code image, but we don't know for sure whether it's still running that image or it's been compromised. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to augment the software on that uh, target device with a verification function. And the verification function is going to enable the verifier to learn exactly what these memory contents are uh, and, and to have some security properties that come along with this so that, that the integrity of these contents is, is assured. So we have to keep in mind continuously that this is just software that might be running on a malicious device. So like the hashing engine from a few slides ago, it could easily return, uh, may, it could easily be malicious and, and do something clever to try to return the expected result. So uh, this is kind of a, a detailed look at this straw man solution where, well, let's just put some checksum function or verification function somewhere in the memory of our device, and then the verification device will challenge the target device, compute a checksum of your memory contents. And unfortunately, even if the checksum code has been modified to hook some malicious code, you know, there, there may be unused memory on the system, and the... the uh, intended checksum function may run with different inputs. And so it's going to compute the correct hash value even though the contents of memory aren't precisely what uh, the intended values should be. 